Today, we're finding out more about a report into the work of crematorium staff during COVID and how it changed the industry, looking at the pressures on the staff, the different rituals that became known in that time, and the long-term changes that have resulted. Um, The report, this one, British Crematorium Managers and COVID-19, was written by the Reverend Professor Douglas Davis, Director of the Centre for Death and Life Studies at the University of Durham, and Dr Georgina Robinson, who both join us today. And alongside them, our guests include Alan Jose, Ambassador for the Westerly Group, and Julie Dunk, CEO of the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management. So we'll start with the authors of the report, I think. First of all, turning to you, Douglas, Uh, Can I ask you, first of all, you are known as the guru on death studies. We have you on lots of our calls. But why did you decide that this particular report needed to be written? Well, it was back in July 2020 that it struck me that we were in the middle of entering into a, a cultural crisis period in which death was the dominant factor before us practically every day on the television, the media, and everywhere. And because I've done so much work historically on cremation in Britain, we edited the Encyclopedia of Cremation, for example, a long time ago. And also because here in Durham, we host the archives of the Cremation Society of Great Britain. I thought we must mark, we must somehow or other observe what's going on so that in the future people can look back on what some folk were saying about it at the time. So I got in touch, it was in fact in July 2020, with the Cremation Society. Uh, I I belong to the Cremation Society, I'm one of their honorary vice presidents, and asked them if they would be interested in helping me run a, a study of crematoria as the whole process went on. They said yes, they were very keen to, and they funded us with a small amount of money to engage in this. And I was very keen that Georgina Robinson, who's one of our our postgraduates, now one of our postdoctoral students here at Durham University, should help us in it. So we set about that. It wasn't It wasn't easy in many ways because we all had different things to be doing over COVID, including teaching and so on. So it wasn't until 2022 that we finally got round to sending a questionnaire out to all British crematoria and then getting some returns from them and then interviewing some people as well. Because COVID went on much longer than many of us were expecting it to. It was a little bit like saying, oh, the war will be over by Christmas, kind of cultural thought. Well, of course, it didn't. It went on and on and on. And I think crematoria staff, well, we'll talk about this now as as our discussions go on, were very pressed by it all. And I was very pleased that some of them, a relatively small number perhaps, but some of them got back to us, took us up on the survey, which we did roughly in May April, May 2022, and had it all in by by then. And it's taken us, a just, little while, taken us a little while to pull it all together. Can I just ask you one of your observations in the introduction? You said that what came across to you most was that crematorium staff felt they were taken for granted or ignored. Can you just tell me a little bit more about that and why you came to that conclusion? Well, because that's what people said to us. And we explore this quite extensively in the report, in the sense that, you know, in research, it's very important not just to take the moment, but to have the background field of things. And the background field in Britain is that we don't think about crematoria very much at all. Although 80% of us roughly will get cremated and we'll go to crematoria and so on, we go out to them, we come back from them. Practically no Britons ever go behind the scenes to see the behind the scenes stuff. We always take our students in Durham to do that. And that's a very important part of their education. But my point is crematoria are culturally background institutions. They're behind the scenes. We use them. It's a bit like the dentist, maybe. We go when we have to, but we're not going to go there regularly as a leisure activity. 
unless you've got a dog and you like to walk it in the crematorium grounds. So it was that I knew, I instinctively knew intellectually that this background nature of crematoria would now become so important for British life in exactly the same way that old people's homes did. Old people's homes in Britain were an embarrassment to many people, not least members of the chattering middle classes. You put your granny in there and you largely forget about it. That's an extreme statement. Of course it is. But during that period, it was old people's homes that came to be center of gravity because so many people were dying there. Now, in a sense, the crematorium was like the old people's home. It was a background, a vital background institution whose social presence was more intense. There was an intensification of the crematorium, if you like, over COVID. And that, I thought, needed research. You see, this is interesting because unless we'd been studying cremation for many years and being very familiar with colleagues like Alan Jose there, for example, and familiar with many colleagues, it wouldn't have come to mind to work on it. They would have remained behind the scenes unknown. But of course, the Cremation Society, once I got in touch with them, were alert to the significance of this. And that is why we set about finding out how our colleagues in crematoria were, had coped. Thank you. And moving on to your co-author, Dr. Georgina Robinson, can you tell us something about what you discovered in the surveys that you conducted? Uh, I was just talking to Douglas there about finding out that people felt they were taken for granted, for example. What was the mood amongst the cremation staff that you found when you asked them to explain to you what it had been like working through COVID? I think many of both responses and then when we further pressed in the interviews that we conducted too, what the mood that very much came about was that these workers almost created a kind of siege mentality. I mean, Douglas referred to, you know, when will the war end? And they really felt they had this responsibility upon their shoulders to ensure that the death care system in the UK didn't fall apart. Um, and I think the long hours, particularly that were reported throughout the survey responses, you, you know, um, I think one crematorium manager reported a, it was a 37 hour day at one point in terms of shifts that were going on, just to ensure that those who were going through those bereavements, they were still being, the, the dead were still being handled respectfully and um, with the dignity that they would always do in their regular day to day life. But I think, as Douglas was alluding to, the fact that Many of them felt that, you know, they weren't even recognized as key workers, frontline workers. Um, you know, they're trying to go and complete these quite harrowing shifts compared with their normal everyday experience, yet couldn't go to the supermarket to get the bread and the milk perhaps that they needed, um, you know, for when they got back from their shift or the next day. That was where I think the kind of immersion came, came through. Um, but I think they felt a gratitude, as I say, and had that, they were sort of carrying carrying the country through so that the disaster that we we did experience wasn't actually as bad um, sort of at a um, public level as it perhaps could have been. Um, but yeah, I really think there was this element of gratitude, wear on shoulders, um, but really pressing on. You know, they felt this responsibility to ensure that their work was was handled appropriately. Just asking you about the context of this survey, was it predominantly people dealing with Christian cemeteries? Um, did you come across any other faith groups? Did you look into how Hindus and Sikhs, for example, carried on their rituals in this time? The survey um, was to the UK crematorium managers. Um, so that spread across both local authority and private crematoria in the UK. Um, we didn't ask specific questions about um, religion or faith in, in that, but um, we did have a couple of managers who referred to different communities that they, they serve. Um, so, for example, one was, um, I think it was their, their Sikh community where they felt particularly troubled by the fact of restricted numbers at funerals and, and that and that kind of thing where that came out um, in terms of having to say no. And the big thing was having to say no in an industry where they always want to say yes. Um, that was really where the emotional uh, impact, I think, was felt by these managers um, and, you know, the confusing directives coming from or absent directives coming from above from the government um, and different local authority guidance too. Um, one of the things that did come out in, in many circumstances was 
you know, um, a bereaved person saying, well, my friend just had a funeral at X crematorium down the road and they were allowed to do this, but we're not allowed to do that here. And I think that changing dynamic and different circumstances too, obviously, depending on familial and uh, cultural circumstances, that was really where the where it got difficult. The survey mentions the emotional toll on crematorium workers um, as they were comforting families who couldn't sit together, they couldn't hug each other. Um, can you tell me something about the stories that you heard? Absolutely. Um, there's one story that really sticks with me, which um, I we first experienced in the, in the written survey responses. Um, but then I actually had the privilege of interviewing this crematorium manager over a telephone interview. And they spoke about how um, obviously they were completing their work on a daily on the daily basis, but on a Friday evening they have a, a baby's memorial garden at this particular crematorium, and this this crematorium manager was taking it upon herself to visit the garden on a Friday evening after work and read stories um, to where the baby's remains are, are placed. And this was also through Stan, the charity, um, and they would take requests too. So I think the immersion work that was being completed on behalf of other people, um, you know, just out of the pure gratitude of, of this particular crematorium manager, that story very much sticks with me. But then we also had other tales of different ritual, um, different types of ritual that the crematorium staff would try and complete, perhaps on behalf of the families who couldn't, who couldn't visit. Um, we saw this in different ways as well in terms of obviously it all depended on the time and the restrictions that were in place, but um, with the technology, the live streaming technology and using um, speakers outside of the crematorium to try and ensure that bereaved people could attend in some capacity even if it wouldn't be as they had hoped. But yeah, I think the emotion that came through and as I say, them having to say no when they really didn't want to, you know, there was comments like we could clearly see that these people were truly heartbroken. You know, they couldn't be with their loved one when they died. They now can't be with them at their funeral, you know, potentially at the funeral or with their, but you know, their kin um, likewise. They can't hug one another despite being so heartbroken. And that, again, I think the crematorium staff did what they could. Um, but obviously in the pandemic time, it was, it was just impossible really to facilitate any of that kind of the normal um, touch and um, embracing that would we would perhaps expect at funerals. Thank you. Douglas, perhaps another question to you is what support there was for crematorium staff through all of this. What use for the clergy in this circumstance? Nothing emerged directly in terms of what the clergy were doing. There was much more in terms of, and here was a great variation, a great Variation across the the, um, the crematoria who responded to us. Some had support systems already in place, discussion systems, preparation systems for emergencies for critical times, very good. And others said we had nothing at all. There was great variation. Some felt that the companies who ran their crematoria <clears throat> were interested and concerned for them. And in other contexts, there seemed to be an absence of those uh, and in some local authorities too. So I think that the fact that, that we were taken by surprise meant that some crematoria in some areas lacked preparation and some in other areas, perhaps the more larger civic ones, were prepared and had emergency groups and committees that they could speak with about all that. But the, to follow on from something Georgina just said, in that stress factor, more than a few commented on the way the media picked up on clapping for the NHS, that there was the public clapping for the NHS, and as a few of them said, nobody clapped for us. No, but that's a very that's a, that's an idiom. It's a little cameo of that kind of of cultural feeling. So preparations varied from serious preparation and support to relatively little. The point that came through, and Georgina alluded to it, was the mutual support amongst staff members and, and working together, mutual support. Those who were not going back to sleep at home or were not orga or changed their family life organisation because they were afraid, perhaps even terrified, of bringing COVID into the workplace. 
the sense that so many depended on them and that it's very strong. And we, we talk about this in, in the little book, really, about what it means when you work together for the good of others, which in a way they're doing all the time, but which became intensified, to use that word again, intensified during this period. Thank you. And uh, moving on to, to Julie, Julie Dunk, you're the CEO of the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management. Has anything you've heard so far surprised you from what Douglas and Georgina reports? No. <laughs> Simple answer. Uh, no. Um, when, when it all started happening, we very quickly, um, combined with other associations in the funeral sector, um, to try and support each other, to try and present a united voice uh, to government. Um, so the first time, you know, funeral directors um, and cemetery and crematorium organisations all worked really well together. One of those things uh, that we we certainly did early on um, was put together a well-being page on our website, on the ICCM website, um, because we knew that members were going to struggle. It was going to be different times for them, difficult times for them. Um, and so we identified that very early on and put support in place for those members. Uh, we also introduced um, a, a webcast weekly to start with, just to keep people updated on what was happening. We issued newsletters pretty much daily, sometimes twice a day as government advice changed. And it, you know, we know it was a very confusing time for people. We know there was a lot of um, resentment of the fact that crematorium and funeral um, workers were not initially considered to be key workers. Um, and yet there was an enormous amount of pressure to keep the death care system going to prevent horrible situations arising, such as having to use mass graves, um, you know, perhaps um, having to look at trench burial, which, you know, is kind of unthinkable. Um, but these when when the pandemic first started, we were told that there could be a year's worth of deaths within three months, which would have been really difficult to deal with. Luckily, you know, even though it was it was awful and there were too many deaths, those figures didn't materialise. But our members were were put on standby for that, which caused a lot of um, a lot of concern. Um, and I think you know. <laughs> I think at a time when perhaps some people were on furlough, um, there may be other sections of the local authority where people were paid to stay at home and not do very much. Cemetery and crematorium workers didn't have that luxury. Um, but it's interesting what uh, what Douglas has said about colleagues supporting each other. And I know in, in some companies and some local authorities, there was a lot of um, people who who was sort of transferred from one role into another. And um, suddenly, you know, they might have been doing kind of, you know, an admin job and suddenly they're there having to learn how to cremate. But many people did that willingly um, and helped support their colleagues and learnt new skills. And some of those people have stayed in that role. They don't want to go back to being a pen pusher. They want to be at the front line. So there was an awful lot of internal support. And certainly... Um, in some areas of the UK, there was a lot of support between crematorium as well. So, for example, the Greater Manchester area, they developed a very close working group of all the the um, managers, crematorium managers in that area. And if they were struggling with staff sickness or anything like that, they were prepared to go from one crematorium to another to help out. And those relationships have, have extended beyond COVID and are still very strong. Is there any evidence that many people left the industry afterwards because the stress had been too great? I don't think lots of people did. There may have been one or two particular cases. Um, I know, you know, for a lot of people, the the pandemic may have been officially over, but the number of, of deaths continued to remain quite high beyond the official end of the pandemic. And I'm not sure that everybody had a chance to really consider um, what the pandemic had meant to them because they just carried on at high level. You know, things didn't ease up for crematorium workers. Um, so I, I think in reading Douglas and Georgina's report, I know there was um, a few uh, people did express that concern, whether they wanted to continue. 
but I'm not aware of a, a, a large number of people leaving the sector, no. Can you give us some context about the cremation industry in uh, in Britain, the people that you represent? I mean, how big is it? Millions of people must die every year, so it must be a multi-million pound industry. Well, I guess some people do make a lot of money out of it. Not uh, not everyone. I'm sure a lot of people, uh, myself included, we came into this line of work because we wanted to offer a service. Um, and certainly my background is very much local authority where it has long been a service rather than a business. Um, you know, things do change over, over years. Um, you say millions of people die, not not nearly in the UK. Um, so if we look at pre-COVID, roughly 560,000 deaths a year um, were, were registered. So, you know, less than a million, just over half a million. Um, during COVID, that number went up in 2020 to over 689,000 and continued in 2021 at 6,000. 667,000, and then it dropped back down to 577,000 in 2022. So that's roughly the number of deaths that we, we've been dealing with over the years. About 80% of those deaths result in a cremation. And currently, I think the latest figures are the 325 crematoria in the UK, unless Alan's opened another one this week that I'm not aware of. But uh, um the, there's certainly uh, roughly around 325 crematoria. About 130 of those are private sector and the rest being public sector. Right. What difference does it make to be either public or private sector? Uh, I, I had assumed that all crematoria were public sector, like uh, burial grounds as well, but that's obviously not the case. No, and the same is true for burial grounds as well. Is that there's a number of different agencies for for burial grounds. It might be local authority, it might be town parish council, it might be private company, it might be um, religious uh, organisations, it might be a charitable. So there's a, there's a, any number of provisions, and um, that makes it difficult to do research because there isn't a central database for cemeteries in the same way that there is for crematoria. Um, difference does it make? Each crematorium is different. Um, they should all offer a very high standard of service to bereaved people. Um, you know, there is some evidence that private crematoria perhaps are more expensive than local authority crematoria, although the range of fees is is not that wide now. Um, um, so it doesn't really, to some people, the, the ownership, they wouldn't even know and it makes no difference to the end user. As long as they're getting good service um, and they're having a, a cremation service or a funeral service in, in a lovely setting, well maintained with beautiful grounds, it shouldn't matter if it's public or private. During COVID, um, did more people decide to become cremated or were there more decisions about cremation because of the of the virus, because of health fears? Did, did that occur at all? I don't think significantly, no. No, I think we... we um, maybe went up to maybe 81, 82% cremation for that period. They're not a massive increase. Um, most people choose burial or cremation based on cultural or religious beliefs. Um, so, you know, we, we did see a rapid increase in the number of cremations from the end of the Second World War um, up to the kind of current state. And it's remained relatively stable for the past few years. So I don't think it did. What did change, though, Ruth, was was people having a cremation separate to a funeral ceremony. So what we call a, a direct cremation, uh, where you know the, the body would be collected, uh, would be cared for, a coffin would be provided, and a cremation carried out, but no actual funeral ceremony associated with that cremation. And those numbers rose significantly during the COVID period. So pre-COVID, I think direct cremation was probably three or four percent of the uh, the cremation sector, and during COVID it went up to about fifteen, sixteen percent of cremations. So quite a significant increase, and that's probably a reflection of the fact that people were were not allowed to attend in large numbers. And I know at the time when it was when it was happening, um, the assumption was that people would have the cremation, would have the ashes delivered back to them. And at some point when the pandemic was over, 
they would organise perhaps a memorial service or a service of remembrance. But I don't think that's happening. I don't know, perhaps Douglas and Georgina might have, um, have a better angle on that, but it doesn't seem to be happening in great numbers. Some of the managers actually expressly commented on that, exactly as you've just said, Julie, that there had been expression that maybe they would, but many of them mm. thought they, they're not really, that once things were over, and that mm. sort of oh, being over is very interesting. One of the themes we pick up in the book is what we call their cultural amnesia. Did it happen? Mm. Did all this happen? Does something happen to the British mind, if I can put it like that, uh, blocking out that period and what happened in it? Uh, it was two people. One one guy said, you know, what the, the amazing thing is, looking back, I wonder if it happened. Did it happen? <laughs> so and that's an what, amazing the, factor. I'm trying to, to understand what this means. Does that mean that funeral directors now have banks of ashes that haven't been t uh, taken by the, the family for... Um, scattering somewhere? Is is there a kind of... Are they just stored somewhere now? We asked a question about that in the book as to whether ashes were created, collected more often or less frequently, and they thought it was more or less the same as before COVID. What people do with them once they've got them, well, that's a different kettle of fish, of course. I think that's going to be an interesting area for some future research that uh, we can hopefully persuade Douglas and Georgina to, to look at is what has happened. How how did those people who perhaps intended to have a service of remembrance at some point, but haven't, how has that affected their grieving? And ha what have they done with the ashes? And that's something that the managers really commented on, on how the direct cremation, the pick up, cremate, deliver, how that affected. I think more of them pressed on the direct, they felt that Funeral ceremonies were important rather than not being important. And that is, as you say, Julie, the question mark hanging in the air that we really do need research on for that whole period of British life. I work for At A Loss. We run the UK um, bereavement signposting website, so we're well connected into the bereavement sector. Um, and there has been a fair amount of research done on the impact of the pandemic on, on grief um, and the fact that People were denied the opportunity to start their grieving process um, because they weren't able to attend funerals or have a what they thought was a, a good send-off for their loved one. Um, and, of course, there was a lot of trauma around the deaths in the pandemic because people died so unexpectedly and quickly um, and in such large numbers. And, of course, we were getting it from the media as well. So all that has impacted on people hugely. Um, and we know that there's a mental health crisis in this country and it's acknowledged now that a lot of that is due to the fact that people were unable to process their grief um, for a length of time and that has now become, uh, for many, um, a mental health issue. Uh, very useful research has been done by um, Bristol and Cardiff University jointly um, on the um, impact of the pandemic on, on grieving families. Um, and of course, uh, the other interesting thing is, although there were, I think, deaths are recorded um, during the pandemic, over, over a million anyway. Um, but of course, the numbers of bereaved people um, who were impacted by the loss of a funeral opportunity um, was significant because we know that eight to 10 people are affected directly by a death. So if you multiply that by a million, that's a lot of people who were in capital. So Jane, uh, uh, coming out of COVID, uh, do you, can you tell us anything about uh, direct cremations now and whether and how popular they are or whether they remain at the 15, 16% anyone, uh, but, but Jane in, in particular, and what the impact of that is, you think, on mental health perhaps? No, th this is a real issue. Um, and I was talking to, um, I've talked to people in the funeral industry, uh, the, 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 represent, the, the professional organisations, I talk to them regularly. Um, it, it is quite alarming, really, that uh, you get these adverts on TV. There's a lot of money being put in um, by the direct formation business. 
and they are sort of mopping up a lot of the funerals that would have traditionally been done by uh, a minister or by a celebrant. Um, <clears throat> and the impact of that is that uh, it's if you've noticed in the adverts on TV, they're, they're all put from the perspective of the deceased, the person who will be deceased, saying, I don't want to cause my family any problem or spend more money than I need to. Isn't that nice of me sort of thing? Well, of course, the funeral's not for them. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, the funeral is part of our mourning process um, and it's part of celebrating the love that's gone. Um, and so there's real concern, actually, in the bereavement sector that this is going to impact significantly on how people deal with their grief. Um, and unprocessed grief uh, can you know, build up into mental health issues and it can take years. It can affect every aspect of life as well. Um, it can affect young people. A lot of young people were affected by the pandemic, interestingly. We thought that older people would be, but in fact, an awful lot of um, people, late teens to, to 30s, lost grandparents. And um, so that was a new experience for a lot of people in that cohort. Um, so, but the direct funeral thing is a bit of a worry. Perhaps we can ask Julie Dunk or, um, or Alan Jose to, to come back on that. Julie, does the industry take direct deaths? Uh, are they concerned about it? Is there advice issued? Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I think, you know, it's good for people to have a choice. And as long as that choice is informed and people understand what a direct cremation actually involves and they're making that choice through informed decision making, then, you know, we don't have a problem with direct cremation. Um, we are concerned that in terms of quality, there might be something of a race to the bottom because there's so many internet firms now claiming to be funeral directors who aren't funeral directors. They're basically brokers. And there's a real pressure on offering the lowest price possible. When you're offering low prices, something has to give. And we've just seen the horrific situation in Hull with legacy funeral directors. Now, I'm not saying that that's connected, but you can see that where people are making savings, something in the terms of quality has to give. And we don't want to be in this position where, you know, we're facing what, what legacy has, has what's happened in, uh, in Hull. We don't want to be facing that again. Um, so, yeah, good informed decision-making, choosing direct cremation is fine. Being forced into that because the cost of funerals is too high is a different matter. We wouldn't want anyone to have to give up having a funeral in the traditional sense because they can't afford it. Can I bring in Alan Jose at this point? Alan, we, we haven't come to you yet. You're the ambassador for the Westerly Group dealing with cemetery and crematorial development. Just if you could stick to the point we're on at the moment, then we'll develop it. But uh, what's, what did you want to say about direct cremation? Yeah, thank you. I think I mean I think there's absolutely no doubt that the the pandemic um escalated if you like the number of um, direct cremations and as Julie alluded to partly because if you were only allowed to have a very small number of people attending a service many people felt that was you know perhaps uh better to have no no people there they didn't have to make a decision maybe about who could come and their an ambition at the time probably was to uh have a service afterwards or some sort of celebration as uh, we've alluded to, though that probably hasn't really happened in the way that people might have expected. I think the uh, the fact is, though, direct cremation certainly has made uh, an impact. And the CMA, who probably have, because every crematorium has to submit their cremation numbers in great detail to the CMA, um, and they have to be you know, divided into whether they're full services or direct and all the rest of it, um, they, their estimate, I think, at the moment, it's between 15 and 20% of cremations are direct, which, you know, is a concern, especially as, uh, as Jane has uh, said, I, I do believe there are issues down the track, certainly for people who, who haven't had that opportunity to grieve in the way that we've you know been used to, uh, and indeed is, is a requirement of how we deal with it. So I think that's where we are at the moment. We'll come back to you in a minute, but I want to bring in Mahinder Singh Chana, who wants to make a point on this uh, issue. Coming from the Sikh community's perspective, uh, I think, first of all, I need to, uh, I must thank the funeral, uh, the crematorium staff and services who continued to provide the service uh, during a very difficult time. 
and our, the Sikhs invariably cremate their dead. And uh, uh, but the, but the interesting to watch the impact what it uh, what it had on the community. Uh, first of all, in normal circumstances, cremation is attended by a large number of uh, people, uh, not only immediate family, extended family, and friends. But of, often people like to pay their respects, and so we have a, often a large attendance. And obviously that curtailed, and uh, that impacted on the community. And uh, during COVID, uh, very immediate members of the family uh, came and took part. And they obviously observed meticulously the restrictions and regulations in place at that time. Uh, so the, the outcome of all this was that a practice of uh, watching the funeral online came into being. So we, uh, so so very very few or very immediate members of the deceased attended the cremation, uh, the, and the rest were given the uh, opportunity or, or given the address where they can wash it online. So that happened with the community that that took place quite a lot, and and uh, but what what the, the 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 effect of that has been. That even today, that practice seems to continue, and whenever there's a Sikh funeral, uh, uh, they 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 give a dress of uh, online uh, uh, facility where they can wash the funeral. Uh, so so it's interesting to see that 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 has continued, and still does. So so people who are live uh, uh, far away, so they don't have. They personally have to come to attend the funeral, but they can wash it on the line. So it is interesting. But I think on, yeah. on the whole, I must uh, again uh, uh, thank and appreciate the devotion of the uh, crematorium staff. They worked under very difficult circumstances and it's much, more, much, much appreciated. And we understood the restrictions. And, uh, and, and the community meticulously, as I said, followed the uh, regulations and uh, uh, restrictions in place. Thank you for making the point. Um, can I, Douglas, can I bring you back in again here, talking about the long-term impact of the changes that came in during uh, COVID? And Mahind has just been explaining one of them, the uh, the Zoom links given to funerals. Um, can you, oh, I, I'm Georgina, tell us what your research found about the long-term trends that began in COVID that, are, that remain today? Plus Douglas first, then Georgina. I think the point that our colleague has just made about live streaming is a key one. We are actually conducting research with a company, Obitos, which played a major part over this period. We have a big European project on digital death, and Durham, we are part of it, and I'm studying them in particular, the people behind the online streaming. Because in this sense, it's very interesting how many people's work is not recognized, and in one sense, the people who keep that stuff running. We're going to look at those. Comments were made about improvement of online rather than paper administration. That was one issue that came up, and they hope that parts of that would continue. Um, collaboration between crematoria, that's already already been mentioned, uh, would, would continue. Most people commented on the direct cremation, because this is happening at many crems every day, not just the big companies that are doing it uh, as an issue as a change in British. One of my students wrote a song. We have 60-odd students studying death, future, and belief this year in this 18, 1920 age group. A very interesting, one of them who was on this last time, wrote a song, which was marvellous. It was about a remarkable young woman who had died. What were they going to do with her? And the song ends with, it's express cremation for her. <laughs> and I thought that was a one, and it's a beautiful song. It really is. Um, but it's interesting that the young that one young guy picked that up to run with. I think they're the the key sort of issues. But maybe an ongoing thing is the kind of duty of care factor, where the local authorities or private companies have for these particular staff who do what is often called in the trade heart work in sort of sociology. So they are the big issues, I think. 
I picked up one, one other one, perhaps, Georgina, you could help me on this, yeah. uh, which was the issuing of invitations to funerals, uh, which which came in in COVID because obviously you had to restrict the numbers. But apparently that's a thing now, like a, a wedding invitation. You have a funeral invitation. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was just thinking about that to, to, to dovetail what Douglas had just said. There were just a few of the crematorium managers that said that was one thing that they expected to continue beyond, um, which I suppose goes against the grain of most bereaved people probably were quite upset by the fact that they couldn't have everybody who might have wanted to be at the funeral attending. But actually for some, um, it was kind of a a happy coincidence. And yeah, that might be something like with weddings, perhaps being invite only and getting smaller or only a particular social circle that um, some people actually only want, you know, the the closest people perhaps to the, to the person who died attending the funeral. And I think this is also on the flip side. Uh, there has been a little bit of research done um, by colleagues down in Bath about direct cremation, which was pre-pandemic. And some of the motivations for those choosing direct cremation was this. We don't want people who weren't surrounded by the person before they died coming along to the funeral to, you know, raise a glass or whatever it might be um, when they weren't really there at the end of their life, perhaps. So I, that could happen. But I think it was only a few crematorium managers who alluded to that one in terms of the invite only um funeral but it seems to be a trend that perhaps is following the the wedding type um event so alan coming coming back to you um you represent so many different uh institutions connected with funerals and burial and cemeteries and all your working life i think has been associated with this um, what's your reflection on um, the the what you've heard, the impact of COVID on your industry? And can you tell us anything about the, the new memorials that have been springing up around the country to pay uh, respect to the crematoria staff and, and others involved in the industry? Yeah, thank you for that. Well, yes, you're right. I've had a very long career in uh, um, cemeteries and crematoria, uh, and I've worked all over the country um working for several different well starting with a private company and then several local authorities before uh joining westerly about 11 years ago um uh and we now operate 40 crematoria and a large number of cemeteries and so on across the country um so i think you know we've obviously seen you know lots of changes post covid some of the things that have carried on are webcasts um they used to be running around five percent for us whereas now currently that level is you know approaching 50 percent of services are webcast which uh, means that families don't have to travel so far um you know which can be good for the environment apart from anything else and good for people who are elderly and perhaps wouldn't have been able to go to a funeral so that you know that's one of the other things is we talk about zoom or teams or whatever they they are now obviously it's quite common practice now because we weren't able to travel freely during COVID for meetings, we do a lot of meetings online. What about the memorials? memorials? We decided at Westerly that we felt um, that it was important to mark the fact that the the COVID pandemic had happened uh, and it has had a massive impact on every, you know, so many people's lives that we wanted to mark that. So each of our sites had a a COVID memorial, which was uh, an obelisk. Um, We had local competitions in six parts of the country to choose designs, which were uh, run through schools and other organisations, and we had chose designs, and then unveiled a series of these memorials at our sites, um, which were particularly interesting in the in the reactions they had. Had a lot of people. We had a little ceremony uh, at each one of those, and in fact, one the Bishop of Leicester, I think it was, who remarked that he'd done some research before that, and that the last great pandemic, you know, that had massive effects was the the Russian flu, of course, of 1919. Um, and there was no memorial at all for any of those at all. But of course, that was all lost in the war memorials that were being erected at the time. But we felt it was important to do um, mark the pandemic in that way. And so that's what we've done. And we're proud to have done that. And I'm pleased there are one or two other memorials. And I know that there's some suggestion about some more, uh, more generally, but uh, we're proud of that, having done that, and I think it's important that it's recognised. Over your long uh, uh, working life with the uh, funerals and crematoria, um, how big an impact did it make on the way that you view your work and the way that the industry operates? 
Well, I think, you know, as we as we would all in the funeral side of things, say the bereavement care sector, the funeral sector, Julius alluded we particularly worked very closely together through the pandemic, which made the system operate effectively and we didn't have all these horror stories. What we've always had, I believe, is a lot of committed people who care every single day for the bereaved in the best way that they can. We often refer to everybody who's, you know, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, at the chapel doors, wherever, uh, whether they be clergy, celebrants, crematorium managers, gardeners, cremator operators, they're all part of the team that look after, you know, the, the structure, if you like, that makes the, you know, the experience of death and loss as bearable as it possibly can be for as many people as it can be. We want, you know, to, to assist the bereaved in the best way they can. You're right, funerals are for the bereaved rather than the deceased. And uh, so it's care and dignif- dignity for the deceased, but also care for the bereaved, which is so important. And that's why mm. you know, that's important. Can I, at that point, pick up a comment that's been made in the chat box here, um, saying that the Law Commission is looking at changes to the law, which uh, would mean that the dis- dis- correct me if I've got this wrong, Julie, that the family of the person who's died can override the deceased wishes when it comes to funerals. Is that right? Currently, yes. Funeral wishes expressed in a will or or anything else are not legally enforceable, and it's up to the executor of the uh, the estate or the next of kin to decide what is actually going to happen. But this is something that the Law Commission have picked up on and are going to be looking at whether that law needs to change and to actually give the uh, the wishes of the deceased more of a legal footing. Um, I'm hoping that they consult very widely on this because I know there's a variety of views. Um, so it's um, I, I can't second guess what the outcome book will be, but so yeah, it's part of a, a larger project mm-hmm. looking at the laws relating to burial cremation and emerging disposal technologies, although they don't use the word disposal now. The, the Law Commission have decided that that word is not appropriate. Yeah. Um, so I think it's new funeral technologies. Um, and that, you know, that review is long overdue. Certainly in terms of burial, we're still working under 1857 Burial Act. And, you know, the, this, the, the legislation is very ancient, um, so it does need a, a good review. And in fact, the Law Commission should have started this work, um, but Brexit got in the way, then the pandemic got in the way. So it's great that they're now finally able to start this programme of, uh, of review. And I go back to things that, um, that were of benefit from the COVID period. One of the things that um, happened was that the Ministry of Justice um, temporarily amended the ration regulations. And one of the things they did was get rid of um, uh, a second doctor's certificate. So traditionally, pre-COVID, um, most deaths, if they weren't re- referred to the coroner, if they were going for cremation, there would have to um, be two forms signed by doctors. One would be the attending doctor who would give the cause of death. And then an independent doctor would sign a, a further form to um, basically um, agree with the the initial doctor. And then a third doctor, the crematorium medical referee, would review both certificates and then authorise the cremation. So, you know, quite a cumbersome process. In 1971, a committee um, chaired by a, a gentleman called Broderick um, recommended that that second doctor's certificate was no longer necessary um, and nothing happened and it was never taken up. So it, it, it was actually the pandemic that finally implemented the findings of a 1971 report. So um, that is something positive that has come out of, of it. Although that's all going to be undone shortly when the new death certification process comes in. Gosh, it's a, it's a complicated. complicated legal area. Thank you for explaining it. it um, Douglas and Georgina, perhaps I can uh, come to you to kind of seal this uh, this discussion that, that we've had. Georgina, um, you are quite a young um, person to be writing about death. Um, and we've heard from Douglas that... Uh, You've got what eighty students, I think you said, aged eighteen, nineteen, and twenty, studying death at, at Durham University. What is the attraction for you? I mean, Douglas has been saying that with cremation, it's hidden away; nobody really knows what's going on. They're 
people don't talk about death. So why are you interested in it? That's a very good question. I mean, you know, death affects every single one of us at some point in our lives, including for our own personal mortality. And um, I think coming in from an like, academic perspective, you know, it's everything to do with our life, therefore influences our death. Um, but I was actually first inspired by, by Douglas's module at Durham, Death Ritual and Belief. I was a student on it. So the fact that I now teach on it alongside Douglas is, um, is quite something. Um, but I, yeah, I think... While there, there is a big community of, you know, death study scholars out there and also the work that all the professionals are doing um, in the UK and elsewhere. But I still feel, as you said, perhaps the, there isn't actually enough attention brought to the subject matter. Um, and so I kind of found it upon myself to take a, a, a almost like a storytelling approach to this and, and take a study from a different approach. Um, but I was sucked in by the, what Julie referred to as the, uh, the law commissions of new funeral technologies um sort of drew me in um but this this project with the crematorium managers was was really um inspiring to be a part of actually so um i do hope that i continue so my parents now call me dr death since i got my phd so i don't know if there's pros and cons you know in terms of what i'm perceived but yeah the students joke i'm wearing pink today that i i don't give off the uh the morbid um perspective that you might expect somebody to be fully engaged in the study of death to be um but yeah it affects us all um so why not why not study it and douglas just coming to you to, to wrap this up um looking at the the research that you've done and uh the changes that have already taken place can you chart the future for us what are the changes that we can look forward to now we've seen Big changes occur because of COVID. But where are we heading to now? Predicting the future when it comes to death is practically impossible, I think. I mean, years ago, we did the first work in Britain on reusing old graves. That went to Parliament. We did the first big research on woodland burial. That's published. Um, But that's, and that's there. There are options. Currently, we've got a knowledge transfer partnership funded partly by the government and partly by Kindly Earth Company, who will be probably amongst the first in England to set up alkaline hydrolysis, the dissolving of human bodies. And we have a full-time associate starting on that next Monday. Uh, she'll be joining us at the Centre for Death and Life Studies. And we will study, once the legalities have been sorted out or that, and it's up and being practised in, in England, and in the UK, we will be studying the families using it, the clergy, the civil celebrants, the funeral directors. So our approach is much more detailed research rather than speculation, to be honest. Right. Um, okay. I think it's wise not to, because what is interesting in the death world is that something emerges and it becomes the flavor of the month, then it vanishes. Like shake, like freezing the dead to death, shaking them up and putting them under a metal plate on the ground. There are all sorts of these things, and they have a spurt of interest and they go. What I think is important is that the the overarching story of ecology, this is the biggest problem that the world has. The death of the earth is really important, and ecology and environmentalism are going to be the, the big stories the meta-narratives, as the sociologists would say, that frame everything. So the lower carbon footprint of alkaline hydrolysis. Which is water cremation. That's water cremation. No, we must get rid of the word water cremation. Cremation is from Latin to burn. It's the Americans selling it who've gone for water cremation, green cremation. Cremation is burning the dead. And that's different from dissolving the dead or composting the dead. So let's get that up front and not keep that phrase going. But the ecological options are going to be coming up there. They exist in Britain at the moment experimentally. So the future is, Julie mentioned option earlier on, this is key. The future is about options and the options will be guided by cultural values and the major cultural values are gonna be ecological ones. They're no longer religious ones. And that's quite an important, but slowly the religions are getting to realize that ecology is important, that salvation applying to the world is as important as salvation applying to souls. Let me put it like that. On that, we have to draw things to a close. Thank you all very much for joining and uh, look forward to your company on another occasion for another discussion. Thank you again.